Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this webinar entitled Islamic Religious Education in Europe. Uh, first, I'll take you some through some uh, technical information. Um, this is a webinar where you are muted and your camera is also shut down. Uh, so you are not able to speak or to, to be seen at the screen unless you are a panelist. And I think that co-authors of the book, which will be discussed today, will also be upgraded to the role of panelists. But uh, unless you are in such a, a, a quality here present, uh, you won't be able to speak. Uh, so that means that you have to post your questions through the uh, Q&A function you find at the bottom of your screen, the double text balloon you find there saying Q&A. There you can post your formal questions, your questions for the Q&A uh, session at the end of this uh, webinar, which will be moderated by Leni Franken. So the chat is only for sharing informal messages, website information and so on saying hello to people as now is happening. That's okay, but for the Q&A, we use it only for the questions to the keynote speakers of today. So thank you for that. In case you would experience any technical problems, you can ask your questions to the UXIA team. Today, it's Annick Willems who is uh, serving you in this respect. But of course, if the technical problems are of that kind that you have to leave the webinar, you can't ask questions anymore. Then you will have to ask them by email. So, uh, welcome again to this webinar. Uh, we were normally supposed to have now, to have had now an online, uh, a live, sorry, a live conference with uh, keynote speakers from across Europe. Uh, two days of intensive study and debate, but alas, Corona made this impossible. This conference, this live conference, is postponed to March next year, and that conference will be hosted by Uxia. University Center St. Ignatius Antwerp, uh, so I'm its director. Uh, it will also be hosted by uh, the center Peter Giles from the University of Antwerp and also by ICOR, which is the Inter-University Center for Education and Law and by ILA, the European Association for Education, Law and Policy. And it is in uh, this respect that I express my gratitude now to Professor Jan de Groof and his staff from ICOR and ELA for co-organizing this event, this conference with us. So the title of this conference, of next year's conference will be Education of Islam, Islam in Education in Europe. So, and this conference will combine a legal and institutional approach on day one with a practical and pedagogical approach on day two. And we have there featuring very interesting keynote speakers, such as Malika Hamidi, Jutta Urpilainen, Rashid Benzin, Ingo Richter, and Merlin Kivjorg. And this is just to mention the keynote speakers. We will have many other experts and interlocutors and authors from the book that we present to you today now, who will also be present then at the conference. So this is publicity for next year. This is a glimpse we took into the future. But uh, nevertheless, we did not want to wait to deal with the theme of Islamic religious education in Europe for two good reasons, actually. And this is uh, why we are having this webinar as a prequel to the conference. The first reason is that solid knowledge about Islam is something that every European citizen would benefit from. European education systems can still improve a lot on that point, and in fact, on religious education as such. One can take the perspective of teaching about Islam or teaching into Islam, and all kinds of issues arise when one wants to establish, for example, an Imam training program at a theological faculty, as the case of the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium has demonstrated. Luckily, and this is the second reason why we have a webinar this afternoon, we have the book edited by our host for today, Leni Franken. Uh, so this uh, book is to shed light on these complex issues in a comparative study. Leni is our host and moderator for today and will further introduce the speakers and the program to you. Leni Franken is a senior researcher at the Center Peter Giles of the University of Antwerp, 
and uh, I'm happy to say that we were former colleagues and worked very well together there at the Center Peter Child. So very good, uh, Leni, to have you uh, back here and to, to be able to work together again. Uh, so I thank Leni for the good cooperation in organizing this event. And I also thank nonprofit organization Mahara for making publicity about this event. And my special word of gratitude goes to Barbara Segart from Uxia, who did again a wonderful job in organizing this event and also the upcoming conference. Enough words of introduction from my part. Uh, Leni, the floor is entirely yours now. Thank you, Stan. And uh, again, welcome to, to all of you. Uh, before I start um, with giving the floor to, to my colleagues, uh, Martin Rothgangel and Abdullah Sahin, I want to say something briefly about how this book on Islamic religious education in Europe came into being. Actually, the, the main idea behind the book was that there is an, an increasing number of Muslims um, in Europe, and there's also an increasing number of students belonging to the uh, Islamic community, um, students with a Muslim background, and we can find these students in Europe also in Islamic religious education classes in state schools if they are organized there, uh, such as in Belgium. Also in uh, state funded Muslim schools, for instance, in the Netherlands, but you can uh, also find these um, students with a Muslim background in schools where non-denominational um, or non-confessional education about Islam, but also about other religions and worldviews is organized, such as in Norway, Sweden, and the UK. And um, one of the, the questions that, that came in, into my mind with this um, new sociological situation was actually how different European nations deal with these kinds of Islamic and religious education and education about Islam. Um, according to the, to the European uh, Court of Human Rights, um, these nations have, have a wide margin of appreciation so they can organize religious education or religion education um, as they see fit, taking into account, into account their historical background, their church and state relationships, and so on and so forth, as long as, of course, the, uh, the right of parents to educate their children in accordance with their own religious and philosophical convictions is guaranteed. So different European nations organize this kind of religious education, including Islamic religious education and education about Islam in, in very different forms. And um, I was wondering what is actually happening in Europe in, in practice. And so um, I asked together with uh, Bill Gent to, um, I asked different um, yeah, uh, specialists in the field uh, of, of 14 European um, nations to have a closer look at the uh, curricula, teacher training programs, uh, study materials that are used, um, inspection of religious education, and of course also to, to have an, a critical uh, look at um, what can, can be done in a better way, what are the challenges of Islamic religious education, and what are good practices um, all over Europe. These uh, 14 um, country reports are in the book followed by 10 interdisciplinary assess on religious education, on Islamic religious education. For instance, uh, starting from a legal perspective, philosophical, pedagogical, hermeneutical, critical perspective. Now, um, this book didn't uh, come there in just a few months. It took a few years. And actually, I shared uh, my, my idea um, for this book for the first time on the NCRE conference in Junsu in, in Finland, that was in 2017. And uh, Bill Gent was also there and he was more than interested in this team and in co-editing this uh, book. And this was the start of a very productive cooperation and of what I can call an academically embedded uh, friendship. friendship. Unfortunately and unexpectedly, Bill passed away in 2020. But in spite of this very, very sad news, 
I decided to continue to continue this book project, which was, of course, impossible without Bill's assistance and input, but also without encouragement from his wife, Lin Gent, who I especially warmly welcome here. I also welcome my um, those um, contributors of the book who are um, here uh, today, um, who will have the opportunity to um, respond um, in a first Q&A round uh, to, the, to the two invited um, speakers. I would like to thank them for a very fruitful and professional cooperation, and I'm sure that Bill would have been very proud of the final result. Finally, a welcome to our two uh, speakers today, Martin Rothgangel and Abdullah Sahin, who will share some ideas on Islamic religious education with you. Martin Rothgangel is head of the Institute of Religious Education at the Protestant Theology Faculty of the University of Vienna in Austria. His research in the field of religious education focuses on anti-Semitism, empirical research on religious education teachers, comparative religious uh, education in Europe, and theory of science and religion. Martin's presentation will be followed by a presentation from Abdullah Sahin, who is a reader in Islamic education at the Department of Education Sci Studies at the University of Warwick in UK. He has conducted research on religious identity form formation among British Muslim students and worked on educational strategies to address the impact of religious extremism within Muslim minority and majority contexts. They will have uh, each about 20 minutes to, to present their, um, their findings uh, uh, about Islamic religious education in Europe. And um, these two uh, lectures will be followed by 20 minutes questions and answers by the other uh, contributors of the book. And then finally, the floor will be open to all uh, of you. Um, and um, the contributors of the book, they can, uh, they will have the possibility to ask question, um, questions um, just by using, by sharing the video and audio. The other um, who are um, here will um, be um, required to use the Q&A function here in the Teams. So um, before we come to this discussion, the floor is to Martin. Thank you. Dear colleagues, uh, first and foremost, I would like to express my thanks to Leni and also to Bill, who has sadly passed away, but whose ideas and spirit are with us today. Leni and Bill have given me the opportunity to collaborate on the book project on Islamic RE in Europe. It is to both of them that I owe the idea for my article and for this presentation, namely, to look at Islamic perspective of European recommendations. As will hopefully become clear in the course of my presentation, the comparative analysis of Islamic RE in Europe not only presents challenges for religious education, but also for future research in religious education as well as for European recommendations. My presentation will consist of three parts. First, a short introduction to the basic idea of the European recommendations. Second, observations regarding Islamic RE in the 14 European countries investigated in this book. And finally, consequences and challenges for Islamic RE in Europe and for the European recommendations. Basic ideas of the European recommendations. For a long time, the matter of religious education has not been an issue for European recommendations. To some extent, at least, France's emphasis on laicide seems to have contributed to this deficit in terms of European recommendations on religious education. But this changed after 9-11 with the Toledo Guiding Principles of 2007. In this OSCE document, two core principles of relevance for RE can be highlighted 
with the words of Bob Jackson. First, there is positive value in teaching that emphasizes respect for everyone's right to freedom of religion and belief. And second, teaching about religions and belief can reduce harmful misunderstandings and stereotypes. In addition, the recommendation dimensions of religions and non-religious convictions with an intercultural education of the Committee of Ministers, which was further developed in the signpost, deserves particular attention. The dominant perspective here is that religion is a cultural phen phenomenon and corresponding learning processes are understood as a special aspect of intercultural learning. With regard to basic educational preconditions, items are formulated such as sensitivity to the equal dignity of every individual, recognition of human rights as values to be applied, capacity to put oneself in the place of others, cooperative learning in which people of all traditions can be included and participate, and provision of a safe learning space are relevant. Furthermore, the following objectives are important guidelines for the observation of RE in general, as well as of Islamic RE in particular. Developing a tolerant attitude and respect for the right to hold a particular belief. Nurturing a sensitivity to the diversity of religions and non-religious convictions as an element contributing to the richness of Europe ensuring that teaching about the diversity of religions and non-religious convictions is consistent with the aims of education for democratic citizenship, human rights, and respect for equal dignity of all individuals. Promotion of communication and dialogue between people from different cultural, religious, and non-religious backgrounds. Taking these basic ideas of European recommendations into account, the following section will present the analysis of the country contributions. At the same time, however, one should also be questioning how appropriate these European criteria are for the different religious educational contexts in Europe, as these criteria result from a perspective that views religion as a cultural issue and prefers RE as teaching about religion, a perspective that is not always and everywhere taken for granted. This leads to the second part, observations regarding IRE in European countries. It is striking how heterogeneous RE as well as Islamic RE are organized in Europe. The very different historical backgrounds are a decisive impulse which can lead to a regional education system even within individual countries. See, for example, Belgium, Cyprus, Germany, and Switzerland. This shows the enormous challenge that any European recommendation faces. Even from a national perspective, it often seems impossible to organize education in general in a uniform way. And this is also true for RE as well as Islamic RE. In addition, the countries pre uh, presented in the book of Lenny and Bill show the following challenges, especially regarding Islamic RE. Expectations of the state regarding Islamic communities, critical public discourse on Islam, critical headlines on Islam in the media, threats from right-wing parties, influence of Turkey and or Saudi Arabia, a diversified Islamic community resulting in Muslim pupils with different linguistic, cultural, and national backgrounds. Another remarkable observation is that there is almost no explicit re reference to the respective European recommendations in the chapters addressed in this book. The case of Greece marks an exception of this general tendency. If one looks closer at the text, one can detect several reasons for this absence. One main reason might be that many European countries, like for example, Austria, Belgium, Finland, and Germany, 
do not comply with the European recommendations insofar as denominational RE predominates and re religion is not primarily understood as a cultural phenomenon. However, this does not imply that in these countries, RE as well as Islamic RE would necessarily contradict the above mentioned European recommendations. An example of this can be found in cantonal curricula of Catholic RE in Switzerland. Here you can read the following passage. Quote, the aim of denominational education is to strengthen the pupils' ability to orient themselves religiously, to promote tolerance and competence and difference. This denominational education should be based on the Christian tradition and reflections on patterns of interpretation in other denominations and religions. Consequently, basic religious knowledge about the Christ Christian religion, its denominations, and its relationship to other religion is imparted. This is intended to contribute to a broader culture, cultural education and the further development of community based on Christian values. Therefore, the development of identity and religious expression should also be promoted." End of the quote. Nevertheless, various problematic points can also be identified in countries with denominational RE in general, respective Islamic RE in particular. Amongst others, the following four points deserve attention. First, there are passages of textbooks opposing Islam and Darwinism and criticizing atheism as humiliating for humans. This is, for instance, the case in a Bulgarian handbook for, for religion Islam, published in 2002-03. Fortunately, there has been a radically new stage of the conception of teaching religion in Bulgarian public schools since 2018-19, where, among others, human rights, bioethics, interreligious dialogue are basic topics. Secondly, a problematic role of the church is shown in the Cypriot South, where the powerful Greek Orthodox Church raises objections against more knowledge about other religions, especially Islam, and non-religious positions into the curricula. It is not necessary to mention that such a position is opposed to the European recommendations. Third, the insufficient training and problematic role of IRE teachers is often mentioned, for example, in Austria, Belgium, and Germany. Finally, although there are increasing attempts and efforts in certain countries, such as, such as Austria and Germany, to establish a cooperative RE, this often happens only between Christian denominations, but not between Islam and other religions. In view of the rise of secularism and religious diversity, there is a clear need for further development along the lines of the European recommendations. That means especially cooperative learning in which people of all traditions can be included and participate. The model proposed in the Finnish text with common and separate phases could in my view be groundbreaking in this regard. If one focuses on the countries of Western and Northern Europe, especially Denmark, England, Norway, Sweden, which conceptually correspond then to the teaching about religions of the European recommendations, some problems and challenges emerge as well. First, from the perspective of Muslim minorities, a non-denominational RE for all can be a problem as it is often dominated by a Christian perspective and Islam is not sufficiently reflected in the curricula or its treatment depends on the teacher. Second, this could be related to the fact that the desire for a safe space can be, in, can be observed among Muslims, which often cons consists in the establishment of a denominational RE in the context of Islamic schools. Remarkable in this respect are also the resistance which currently prevents the establishment of Islamic schools in Norway and Flanders. Third, in contrast to the European recommendations, 
the teaching about religions and beliefs can reduce harmful misunderstandings and stereotypes, it can be observed that also this organizational form of RE can produce othering effects and prejudices against Islam and Muslims. Fourth, a school subject RE for which the state is responsible can be mixed underhand with national elements, e.g. when talking about Danish, English, or Norwegian values. Especially an understanding of religion as a foundation of culture can strengthen this effect. A quote from Denmark can demonstrate the point. This cultural emphasis on Christianity as a cultural entity crucial to the Danish state places Islam as the other in a dichotomy. The latter aspect is linked with an essential last point. Religion and RE are closely linked to personal identity as well as social identity issues. This can also be observed in England where a turn towards religion for a sense of belonging is observed among Muslims and the desire for a RE is found which treats religions not only like a quote shopping list and ignores the question of God and transcendence. Finally, it should also be mentioned that the politically motivated weakening of RE currently observed in England or even is ex exclusion from public schools as in France is no solution. The following remark by the director of a French private Muslim school makes this clear, quote, we try to bring the pupils back into the heart of Islam with a good understanding. You haven't done it in state schools, let's do that. This brings us to the third and final part of my presentation. Consequences and challenges for IRE in Europe and for European recommendations. After a long period without European recommendations on religion and education, the recommendations outlined above represent a clear step forward. Politics is the art of the physical. In this sense, one can consider the understanding of religion as a cultural issue and the preference for RE as teaching about religion. Nevertheless, the analysis in the second section makes it clear that the understanding of religion and RE of the European recommendations does not correspond to European plurality. Furthermore, this understanding of religion and RE takes insufficiently account of the personal and social identity issues associated with religion. So far in Europe, there have been no comparative studies that empirically examine the effects of different forms of RE on pupils. For example, in terms of a tolerant attitude, the knowledge about their own as well as other religions, the ability to change perspectives and so on. On such an empirical basis, recommendations could be made which correspond to European plurality and could take a more appropriate account of specific contexts. There's still a consid considerable need for development of the different forms of IRE in Europe. Three questions might be crucial. Will forms of denominational RE succeed in establishing cooperative phases with RE of other religions, as well as with subjects such as ethics, philosophy, and citizenship education? Will a neutral RE for all succeed in considering adequately the identity questions of both religious majorities and minorities? And third, Will a comprehensive subject with religious as well as non-religious worldviews succeed in avoiding a functionalization of the state and a marginalization of the religious dimension? Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Martin, for your very nice and uh, clear presentation. I give now the floor to 
Abdullah, who will also tell you very interesting stuff, I suppose. Thank you, Lenny. <clears throat> I hope my screen is visible. Yes, it is. Thank you. Bismillah rahman rahim um, Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm very pleased and to see this wonderful work, seeing the light of the day. Special thanks to Lini for carrying out this project that my dear friend and late colleague, Bill Gent, has uh, immensely really contributed to. So I'm very pleased that this is um, an achievement and uh, I'm sure we'll have been really, really well pleased with this outcome. And, and I extend my thanks to Lini and Barbara for this kind invitation uh, to share some of the uh, reflection that I've shared in my own contribution to the volume. Um, what I would like to share with you are really basic three uh, points. When we think about the way in which we perceive, uh, facilitate and- uh, Excuse me, Abdullah, sorry to interrupt you, but there seems to be a problem after all with sharing uh, the screen and the PowerPoint. Maybe you can try it again and not go to the presentation mode in PowerPoint because then it sometimes is blocking Zoom. So if you just start the PowerPoint as you did before and just go through the slides in the, the way you can still work on the, on the slides in that mode, that would be nice. Sorry to interrupt uh, you. No, sorry. Is it visible now? No? We are still waiting. Yes, it is visible now. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Great. Um, so I have three points to make in my presentation. <clears throat> uh, Sorry, am I still visible, Mini? Yes, you are, but your um, shared screen is uh, is again gone away. I, yeah, we have we have tried this, haven't we? <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> now I see a wonderful bird bird on my screen. Yes, let me get rid of the bird. Yes, yes, just, just, yes. Remain, okay. just remain in this mode. Don't go to don't go to presentation. Uh, don't go mode. in the full no. screen. No, oh. exit it again because that, that sometimes causes trouble. Oh, okay. Oh, yes. okay. Just, yes. just remain that, okay. in this mode. Thank you. Yes, right. Okay, great. Let's keep it as it is. Yeah, third time, good time. <laughs> so what I would like to share with you is really three main points. Uh, when we think, reflect on how we facilitate teaching and learning about Islam within different educational settings, uh, particularly within the Muslim minority context of Europe, uh, I feel there are three challenges. One is a contextual challenge that could be summed up with the rhetorical question of what is Europe's Islam question? And I'll try to unpack this in a minute. The second question is to do really with the conceptual aspect of uh, Islamic education, Islamic religious education. In other words, are we all clear across different European uh, political educational context when we say Islam education, Islamic education, Islamic religious pedagogy, Islamic religious education? So there is a bit of a, a conceptual challenge there so that we could actually say confidently that we all mean when we use these expressions. The third challenge is, which is to me, it is the heart of the problem, is the pedagogical challenge. Uh, 
as a Muslim educator who has been working within the British context, within the you know, Muslim minority context of Britain over now nearly two decades now, I can see that the main problem is actually how do we facilitate contextual reflective teaching uh, of Islam regardless of the actual educational setting that could be a publicly funded school, it could be a supplementary mosque school, uh, or it could be an Islamic ethos school that is funded by, uh, by the government. The key thing is, uh, how do we actually, do we have enough models to say that we are able to facilitate a reflective, critical teaching and learning of Islam that doesn't upset Muslim communities, uh, but also is not reduced to a simplicity of uh, instruction, uh, indoctrination, uh, or simply transmission of certain knowledge. So let's come look at the first contextual challenge. You know, educational discourse, legal approaches to educational rights, political rights cannot be detached from what is really happening in the wider context that we are living in. In. Uh, so there is obviously since 9-11, uh, as you just heard, there are really complex issues facing Islam in Europe and, and Muslims. And these are to do with the migration, the colonial uh, history, and of course the current post-colonial community formation, formations that are happening across uh, Muslim communities in, in, in different parts of Europe. So how really Islam and Muslims are positioned within secular liberal democratic societies? To what extent Muslims and Islam are being really accommodated? And to what extent, of course, the secular liberal uh, state makes demands on it as Muslim citizens in terms of inclusion, in terms of um, integration? So we do have issues around Islamophobia, extremism, responses to that are the results of highly problematic concept of securitizing education itself. And this is sadly the case, uh, even in my own context in, in the UK, where we have now prevent the securitization policies found its way into even primary schools. And I don't understand how this could be reconciled with European liberal rights-based democratic uh, uh, principles. So th there are obviously demands for assimilation, integration, uh, but this is a kind of a binary really, which probably we need to transcend. Uh, you know, is there a way that we could facilitate living together, a peaceful coexistence, which we all recognize requires kind of a reciprocity in accommodating and acknowledging one another. So the demand is not always on the other, the minority but actually the state apparatus, the wider political so-called mainstream should also need to reconsider its own uh, existing institutional frameworks. Uh, to, and, and if it is need be, it needs to be reflecting on whether they are adequate. So in other words, it appears that secular liberal democracy originally developed to cater for Europe-based diverse denominations uh, of Christianity it is finding very hard to actually accommodate the uh, presence of Islam in its midst. And that is a puzzle because secularity really means inclusion of diversity of worldviews and religious traditions. Why is it that when it comes to Islam, the accommodation seems to be very, very difficult. It is inclusive logic, it's just not been extended to Islam and Muslims. Now, I say this contextual challenge, I just give you a bit of uh, statistics, sadly, which are telling us how the contextual reality is very frightening. I can only talk about the context I am most familiar with is British Islam. So we have uh, several databases that are you know, regularly produced, uh, monitor the situation of uh, religious minorities. So you have in, in the British context, you have 48% of British Muslims living in poverty, for example, compared to any other religious group, this is really high. 46% of Muslim population in England lives in the most deprived 10% of local authorities. And the list goes on and on. 
uh, you have some positive sounding uh, statistics like lots of young Muslims appears to be having access to higher education. But when you look at closely to the statistic, you realize actually uh, most of the data is, is, is telling is the fact that Muslim young people are increasingly finding themselves on the courses that are not satisfied with, or they experience high dropout rates. And even if they finish their degrees, the kind of post-university job market appears to be hindering their access to jobs, particularly for females. Hence, even higher education doesn't seem to be actually working to facilitate social mobility for this particular minority group. And then we have uh, a kind of a political philosophy question. You know, legally having rights in, is one thing, but actually accommodating, you know, having a kind of a, uh, an interpretation of uh, philosophical traditions, moral traditions, facilitating inclusion of the Muslim other is another thing. So I give you three examples that I'm familiar with. When it comes to a debate, to, to what extent Islam is compatible with liberal secular democracy, usually, we have quite dominant perspectives in, in philosophical sort of circles. One is associated with uh, you know, uh, Rawls' theory of justice, who talks about equal liberty and equality principle of, of liberal tradition. Uh, and however, when you closely look at this wonderful theory, it actually appears to be highly um, Europe sort of based traditions. So in other words, Philosophically, really, it is not ready to accept there could be non-European based religious moral traditions, uh, and therefore there could be a kind of a you know, conflict avoided. So in other words, liberal theories often really work with the reality of European traditions, and they always assume that the minority groups will confirm to that particular liberal tradition. So we have, uh, you know, Rawl famously says that in a, in a plural social context, even if you, if you have people not confirming to the European liberal moral theory, the chances are we can't even agree on the definition of a public good that all could share. So a second example is from Habermas, who's quite sort of his neo Marxian perspective and his critical theory. He allows more space for you know, the concept of post-secular, which is a theme in the book as well, but when you closely look at Habermas, even his Habermas's theory of communicative action, actually it is closely based on demand, an implicit demand that the minority non-European moral traditions, they should really turn their self-understanding into a language of intellig intelligibility by the mainstream. I.e. you have to really find a kind of a secularizing language to be able to be acceptable. This is a very crude way of putting it, but even the most enlightened progressive approach within uh, political theory in the West seems to be making demands that the non-European traditions should actually have to confirm to the mainstream European traditions. And finally, there is uh, Alistair McIntyre's famous uh, privileging of the tradition knowing where he actually challenges the traditions of modernity and, and liberal secular West. His problem is the is secular modernity, and he wants to really sort of you know bring back the clock a little bit. He wants to go back to kind of pre-modern enlightenment time, whereas we have Aristotelian virtue ethics as appropriate within the medieval Christian uh, traditions. So, in other words, if you even go to look at the McIntyre who privileges uh, traditions over the secular uh, philosophies, in fact, the kind of tradition he's advocating is a very monolithic sense of tradition. And finally, I don't have time to go into it, probably maybe people who make a bit of noise about the need to decolonize study of religions, in, in fact, the whole education, maybe they have a point. So these contextual challenges, intellectual challenges are really difficult to overcome if we are working within a minority religious tradition. Uh, coming to the conceptual challenge, here we have, uh, you know, really we need to be a, a little bit uh, clarifying the concepts that we use. So we hear a lot about Islamic religious education, uh, Islamic education, Islamic religious pedagogy, but the word education is often, depending on the context, is really meant to be either instruction or nurture, uh, or even in fact, 
you know, faith to faith indoctrination. So if Islamic religious education is meant to be facilitating studying religion, how is it different from religious studies? Is there a difference between the concept of religious education and religious studies? Knowing a little bit about inclusive RE tradition in, in, in England and Wales, I would say there is a big difference, and this may not make sense to our European colleagues, but I think in the publicly funded mainstream RE, uh, that really is a kind of a different way of framing study of religion, where we not only facilitate learning about religion, but also there is a space for learning from religious traditions. I won't go into these de details, but just to highlight, across Europe, we have RE models that were all developed within the denominational or the secular education systems. Now we are trying to really patch a space for Islamic religious education. The question is, here we have really complex self-understandings of what it means to be taught, educated, in different faith traditions. Um, so clearly this particular, you know, the book project was, to my knowledge, looking at more closely diverse European RE models and, and looking at how space for Islam has been taken up or has been developing. So therefore, probably, uh, you know, we are talking about 14 maybe different types of models. And they all probably mean different things when we use the concept of Islamic religious education. Uh, to me, regardless of how uh, in the public space, in, in publicly funded schools, uh, compulsory schooling stage, it doesn't matter how religions, provision for religions are framed. It appears to be that when it comes to Islam, the kind of a purpose behind this exercise is, is or, or the kind of educational good which is intended to be achieved in Islamic religious education. Uh, really, it comes down to two main, uh, I suppose, ethos, two main aims. One, clearly, as we just mentioned, there is this secular state's desire uh, to, uh, I suppose, produce politically correct versions of Islam. Uh, and it is coupled with citizenship securitization. So there is, there is obviously the interest of the secular state in creating space for Islam to be taught within the official educational um, curriculum or, or policy. Opposite of this uh, is this huge emphasis upon parental rights, legally speaking. So the parents obviously want to transmit their values to their young generations. But because these parents are coming from uh, the majority context, their children, offsprings, they were never actually born and brought up in such a context. So the question would be, uh, why do we privilege parental rights over children's rights? By which I mean, why do we privilege an exercise expected from Islamic religious education where parents almost force sometimes certain identity narratives, cultural narratives, to be replicated in the life of their young people. And of course, coupled with this, we have the reality of transnational Islamic movements. They all have their own uh, agendas or interests. So the question is, why don't we privilege and see what are the actual needs of children and young people themselves? What do they really want and how they want to study Islam? And what they want to really achieve out of that study. So here we have questions. If you want to have a balanced view, in my view, uh, to uh, present a provision, education provision on Islam and Muslims, uh, which could take place in the mainstream schools, or it could take place in Islamic education settings like Islamic schools, or in a purely religious setting like a madrasa, supplementary mosque school. In my mind, really, because the situation is so complex, I think we need to have some sort of pedagogic creativity, uh, kind of resources that are actually suitable uh, for European Muslim young, young people and children. And that required inevitably provision for a kind of a critical reflective teaching and learning of Islam. And that means we have to raise questions to what extent in Islamic tradition or traditions in Islam we have a notion of education that could allow space for 
facilitating agency of the learner. Can we talk about in Islamic education, a space for a learner-led educational process? Or Islamic education always requires teach, teacher, text, instruction centeredness. Uh, and, and what kind of obviously good we want to again serve within Islamic education? Can Islamic nurture be critical, reflective, capable of re responding to the young people's needs? Uh, and after all, you know, what is education in Islam? Really, is it a form of cultural transmission uh, incapable of generating a theological language of faith development? Or it can. Uh, so, of course, further than that, to what extent Islamic education could also give space for diversity within the Muslim faith, as well as diversity of other religions and different uh, ways of life or different value frameworks or worldviews. To what extent in such an Islamic education context, there is a space for the knowledge of the other that could be religious or non-religious. Um, so that brings me to my bold uh, offer or my theory thesis. I think we have reached a point uh, within you know, Europe that uh, in order to be able to facilitate a mature expression of Islam or expressions of Islam, I think education are, are crucial, but Islamic education itself needs to develop a professional approach. I call this uh, Islamic education studies. This will work with the existing RE frameworks, denominational, secular, different models, but I think in order to actually be pedagogically creative uh, and respond to complex issues like Muslim teacher education, curricular development, pedagogic creativity, we really need to open up the field as a professional area of study, which is inclusive of Muslim educators, but also could cater for the needs of non-Muslim RE teachers who happen to be teaching Islam and, and about Muslims in different settings. So that kind of um, professional approach to Islamic education studies could obviously draw on the existing RE framework and could ideally work within education studies departments uh, so that there's a balance between a the theological perspective and also the education studies perspective. Um, so that requires the field to be a research-based uh, you know, uh, area of um, scholarly study and, and development. Uh, that means gradually, you could have diversity within theoretical perspective on Islam and education. You could look at you know, empirical research, feeding into the teaching and learning. You could also look at how, what we probably do probably best in, in England and Wales is also to teach living Islam, not simply as historical theological Islam, but also through conducting uh, ethnographic research that people like uh, Bill, you know, were really good at it. And of course my colleague at Oric Religious Education Research Unit is to utilize actually social science uh, research tools to develop pedagogic materials by just looking at how Islam is lived out in European different settings. And gradually this will lead, lead into obviously uh, helping public understanding of Islam and facilitating better Islamic literacy. Um, so I can, my final points are really to do with my own experience. My own journey started with thinking how do we develop uh, Islamic education provision within Muslim minority context of Europe led me to look at kind of assessing the current Islamic education provision and then seeing how they are actually impacting on the formation of attitudes and identity of young people and also whether it leads to uh, Muslim young people develop proper religious literacy or not. So that, that kind of research has taken me into gradually uh, proposing that actually the best way to develop a professional development approach to Islamic education is collaborate, advocate collaboration with mainstream universities and Muslim communities. Unlike continental Europe, really, uh, we don't have direct state interference in terms of creating uh, departments at the university level for Islamic religious pedagogy or Islamic theological education, which is a very fashionable policy development in continental Europe. There is a kind of a mixed success story, basically. But I think a, a much more civic and democratic uh, way would be to include Muslim communities uh, 
with university collaboration, look at these educational challenges facing the Muslim community. And that requires really professional development of Muslim educators, enhancing uh, RE, generic RE specialists, their knowledge and understanding of Islam. And that collaboration could actually be quite uh, useful and, and productive. And at Warwick, I'm very pleased that we did have such a collaborative uh, partnership with the local Muslim community and the university, uh, particularly in this education studies department, uh, with a lot of input from the local community and Muslim philanthropy. And we've established professional um, courses where we cater for the needs of diverse groups of Muslim faith leaders and educators by recognizing what they study in their own local seminaries and Islamic education settings, but helping them develop pedagogic skills uh, where they could actually create a much more contextual teaching and learning of Islam and faith leadership education. Uh, so we, the courses, it's a very small experimentation, but we can, we have now enough evidence to suggest that such partnership, civic partnership with the community is much more meaningful in the way in which we can raise some of these difficult questions. And I will simply leave you a couple of nice pictures from my current students who are Muslim educators who have traditional Islamic theological education in their own local communities, but they come and stay, spend a year with us at Warwick, where we help them to develop uh, pedagogic uh, skills, educational skills, and they bring the skills back to their community. And the idea is, as such, they, they begin to actually introduce teaching and learning of Islam within their own edu Islamic education set settings in a much more contextual way. And similarly, we have RE teachers who are with us who work within the mainstream RE, where we don't have enough expertise on Islamic faith tradition. So they benefit a lot uh, from the, the kind of Islam expertise we develop at Warwick. I hope I have conveyed some um, intelligible um, conclusions for you to, to, to draw on. And I look forward to discussion. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Sahin, um, for your clear and challenging lecture. Um, I think it is now time to, um, to open the floor to the, those um, panelists, so the, the co-contributors of the, of the book. Um, so you can ask your question by um, raising your hand and then you can uh, unmute. Um, I propose to, if you have a question, to, to pose just one question, to do it one by one in order to give your co um, fellows the, the possibility to ask also their questions and to um, maybe to briefly introduce yourself because I know um, all of you, but uh, most people uh, or many people don't know you. So, um, Yes, if uh, there are questions, please um, raise your hand. Oh, no questions? I can't imagine that. Maybe I have, yes, I have a very technical question. Uh, Abdullah, can you um, stop uh, screening your, uh, uh, yes, sharing your screen, thanks. Oh, there, now I can see, uh, Sibren, you have a question. Welcome, Sibren. Yes, thank you, so, thank you so much. Sibren Milima from the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam. I'm emeritus in the Faculty of uh, uh, Religion and Theology and uh, Behavioral and Movement Sciences. And I was one of the uh, people who were contributing to the second part of the book. I, I, I have a question for Martin. So I was, you said there's a lot of, sometimes there's a deficit of references to the European recommendations, and there's even some opposition to that. And that, that brings me to the, the strategic kind of question. You can have a very nice signposts. Uh, you can have a lot of articles and books, uh, chapters and kind of published, 
But nevertheless, uh, on the ground, you uh, do not touch uh, the persons who really need to give a form and content to uh, different practices in uh, relation to the uh, European uh, recommendations. And I, I, my question to you is, can you elaborate a bit on how do you think um, uh, that uh, people can be invited or some uh, in, yeah, to, to, to really deal in their practices with these European recommendations? So otherwise it's still going on. And for, for instance, in my own reaction, I saw, uh, I, I dealt with uh, uh, Islamic religious education and citizenship. Sometimes there is no reference at all in the country uh, uh, report uh, uh, on, on uh, citizenship education. And so the recommendations are really uh, very clear. So it's religious and worldview education, it's human rights education, it's citizenship education and even moral education. So. Just help me a bit uh, in, 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 in bringing to the fore your ideas how we can really, in the theory and practice can meet and policy and practice and theory can meet better than it's going on now at the moment. I will try and I will try to share my screen again if it's possible. Uh, one second. Oh no, no, it doesn't work, but it, it doesn't matter. Um, oh no, it works. Sibren, um, we should take the Toledo guidelines, guidelines, we should take the European recommendations. Um, I think um, we should apply them deeper. Look, the European recommendations, um, I see the strengths that they are inclusive regarding the classes. No child left behind, independently from its uh, uh, religion or conviction. And look at, uh, look at this uh, quote from Toledo guideline. When tensions result from pluralism, the role of the authorities is not to remove the cause of tension by eliminating pluralism, but to ensure that competing groups tolerate each other. What I can see on the level of European recommendations, only one line is strengthened. They talk about inclusiveness regarding the school class, but they aren't inclusive regarding the European context. So example for the Austrian or German context, they are far away. We talk also about human rights, it's self-evident. But when I read even signposts or the, uh, uh, other documents, uh, they are talking about uh, denominational RE, it's nurturing and so on. And I feel the distance. I feel just the distance. Look at this quote also of Toledo guideline. You can see how would you feel if you would favor a denominational RE, a reflective one. Would, uh, that talks about religiose Bildung. That means, yeah, the pupil, its belief, it's, um, it's in the center of religious education. It's the way how it is there in Germany. And now look how Toledo guideline formulate teaching about religions and not denominational. And just look the market space. And so many countries uh, in Europe that are denominational oriented, they are not on the board. We should be more inclusive. So future European recommendations should be based on research work. What are really the effects? Actually, until now, there are only claims. We do have some evidence um, of the Enrica project. And this was amazing evidence when we, when we did empirical studies regarding the teachers, because the teachers in the German context, for example, they aren't as denominational. They also handle this in a neutral way. And also we can see in countries, they say we are uh, teaching about religion. Huh? Sometimes they have their standpoint and so on. So the difference aren't as big. So my suggestion would be, let's try to get more empirical evidence first. It's a research work. And second, 
European recommendations should really deal with the plurality of Europe. What they would like to, to, that should happen in the classroom, it should happen regarding the countries of Europe. Sibren. Thank you. Uh, we, we can talk later when we can meet uh, in real life uh, again. I would like it, Sibren. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. With some more questions. I hope you didn't fall asleep. Lenny, if, I, I, well, I, if not, I will go ahead, maybe. Yeah, I, uh, I, I'll continue. And, and my, my question <laughs> yes, is for, please. <laughs> for, for Abdullah, because I, what struck me is, is the, the partnership you were, you were talking about. So um, that's really, uh, we were just talking about theory and practice and politics. So here you bring the stakeholders together. And, and so then uh, 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 the practice, practices can really profit from theory and vice versa. Um, but, but you were talking about the pedagogical challenge. So what kind, what kind of pedagogy is needed to, to really uh, bring this, these partnerships uh, further? So uh, can you elaborate a bit on that? Yes, <clears throat> thank you. It's a really good question. I think this is, this is the very heart of what the legal provision wants to achieve. Ultimately, uh, you know, we want to see uh, religions are taught as part of what it means to be a European educated young child or young young adolescents, regardless of their religious or non-religious background. So the legislation is fine, but to me, the, the, the key problem is we haven't really come sort of taken seriously the pedagogic challenge. How do we convince community, like an Islamic community, for example, which is experiencing challenges, Islamophobia, discrimination, or how do we convince parents, stakeholders, that actually uh, teaching Islam in an indoctrinatory fashion is really not the way forward if we want to see young European Muslims developing intelligent faith development and able to relate to the European context. This is where the heart of the challenge lies in, in, in my view. We have to really win the hearts of the minds of the leadership or the parents, but convince them that actually it is children's interest that is more important. So I feel the current legislation privileges parental rights, but doesn't really cater for what the children actually need. And what children need is, uh, is a much more learner-led teaching and learning culture. This could be done in an Islamic school context, in a mosque, I would even say. I don't think there is any more justification for instruction in a mosque. We cannot no longer teach religions without recognition of the wider world. Now that requires genuinely winning the support of the parents and leaders. What I believe in my example, from my experience, by bringing Muslim community to support my work at Warwick has achieved was the fact that they believe that, yes, we want young people to develop intelligent Islamic faith development. And that requires Muslim faith leader, educator, to have a, a resources of pedagogic creativity. We can no longer rely on textbooks imported and very simplistic, mechanistic way of teaching and learning instruction. We got to really fashion a reflective way of looking at what it means to be Islamically educated. And to me, this cannot be done unless we win community support. I know that the governments across Europe are keen because they have problems with extremism, with uh, social cohesion, citizenship. It is top to bottom. It's, it's nice to have money and departments where we have Islamic religious pedagogy, but it is useless when you don't have a quality pedagogic outcome where you, where you show research-wise it works. It becomes an anti-democratic way of, to me, an uncivil way of sadly uh, trying to cater for the needs of the secular state. I think we need to really look into detail what young people, European young people need. 
Muslim or non-Muslim, religious or non-religious, they will all benefit if we have reflective contextual pedagogies presenting diversity of religions, including from faith to faith. Even the nurture, I would say, has to be reflected. And this is where at least I would say effort, energy, and money have gone into last probably uh, 10 years, 15 years. Uh, clearly, we all agree that provision must be there across secular, non-secular context. But I think now we have reached the next level, creating more partnerships with diverse Muslim communities, allow them to say, yes, they are happy, not happy, but we need to professionalize, convince them that actually Islam, for example, is simply not for Muslims at all. Islam could be educationally utilized for the benefit of all. That means pedagogic creativity. Uh, and that requires, in, in, in my case, uh, developing a research-based reflective attitude to Islamic education, where we don't simply deconstruct Islam, uh, but we actually develop really meaningful materials approaches as to how teaching and learning of Islam could be meaningful for all who are involved. And that requires energy focus on pedagogic creativity. And I think the partnership are the best way forward. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm fully with you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, as I don't see any raised hands, but I see a question in the q and um, We will go to the to broader discussion, but of course, those uh, who didn't raise their hands have still the opportunity to do so if they want to. So the question is here from Riza, oh, uh, Joe Firen, uh, sorry, I cannot really, Joe Firelli or something like that. Um, how compatible is Wahhabism with European values? I think that's a very interesting and difficult question. Um, so, Abdullah, do you have any idea? Right. Do I look like a Wahhabi? No, just joking. Um, well, um, you know, clearly um, this is where we need to be a bit, I think, take up an educational attitude. I don't think we can simply dismiss different interpretations of Islam. I know that we have concern with different, you know, extreme interpretations, uh, but in, in a public space, in, in, a, in a public square, where we are talking about everybody's interests and needs, um, we really need to find out, uh, you know, what kind of Islamic sub-tradition these communities represent. But that doesn't mean we should acknowledge and accept that. Certainly, you know, if you are in Germany, a Turkish um, religiosity is the main, is the kind of the, the source. If you are I don't know, in, in Britain, maybe there is a subcontinent and even uh, you know, so, sort, of, sort of Wahhabi, so-called the Gulf sponsored religiosities. Of course, ultimately we do need uh, an, an, an Islamic religiosity that makes sense within the European context, but we cannot simply dismiss these sub-traditions because, you know, people invest, you know, it is their values. The point would be, how do we create enough internal reflective minds who could see the degree to which their interpretations make sense or don't make sense in European secular context. So, um, you know, this is typically, I think in, in the book, which is rightly picked up as the hermeneutic challenge. Uh, so, you know, th 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 there needs to be a space for creative interpretations catering for diversity within a faith tradition. But hermeneutic task is not there to deconstruct endlessly. Right, this is the danger of hermeneutics because if you say, right, I am a Shia Ismaili, I don't like the mainstream Sunni Muslims who are dominating the RE scene. Therefore, I would simply say, we don't need Sunni Islam. We don't need local authorities. We need a Shia Ismaili Islam to be taught. Well, I mean, how fair logical is this could be? And then you have to look at the task of hermeneutics is to really fine tune diverse sub-traditions within a mother tradition and I respect all of them. So in other words, uh, and of course, if, if you're looking at in, in Islamic tradition, then you have to realize not only a historical development of Islam, it is diversity, 
but also contemporary diversity has to be catered for without judgment or value judgment. But then you will realize that within Islam, obviously there is space for hermeneutics, for example, uh, but then you, you have to understand that this hermeneutic strategy has been utilized strategically in the past. So ta'wil, hermeneutics, for example, in Islamic tradition is widely utilized by Shia Ismaili groups, simply to really deconstruct what they perceive to be the mainstream. So in other words, we have to understand there's an ideology, ideological uh, take on hermeneutic, nice word. Uh, so, but what is really good is it will tell us that traditions have been appropriated, re-articulated in a very complex ways. A good Islamic education, a good RE, should be able to unpack these for all audiences, right? And that requires, again, pedagogic creativity. Otherwise, it will be, again, privilege minority for majority, majority for minority. This is not the way, I would say. And sadly, uh, I, I hear a lot in the, in the volume as well, this is the, the kind of point I'm a bit critical, that the word hermeneutics is being used as if it is a positive thing. It depends who is meaning by what, by hermeneutics. It could be the construction, it could be constructive. But clearly, a good RE, a good Islamic education's task is first to contextualize these voices and then allow them to be heard and then put into balance. That is a difficult task. So we should really be inclusive in the way as much as we can uh, to give space for all communities and their way, beliefs and values and their take on Islam or, or different Islamic traditions, all but with the knowledge and understanding that young people or the learners would contextualize. Otherwise, it will be another sort of game of privilege, underprivileged stuff, which you really want to avoid. And if you could do that, that kind of educational openness, if you could create a critical openness, there is space for everyone. Because what we want to do is, what education is best, is make young people curious about one another in positive sense to find out, not to simply learn and dismiss each other, declare each other to be wrong. I think that that is a delicate balance. It's a problem not only for Islamic education, but also Islamic, you know, RE across really. I hope I've answered. Okay, thanks. I see another question from my near colleague, Patrick Loback, and actually it's exactly the same question I was, uh, going to ask you, I will quote uh, in, in Patrick's words, it's for Abdullah, can you explain why Rawls, especially his political liberal, liberalism and his idea of the overlapping consensus is not open enough, not adequate enough to include Islam? And what is the alternative? Yeah, well, it's a good question. You know, I don't want to dismiss Rawls' wonderful, you know, liberal sort of take on justice, social justice. I think I think it is, it's a great achievement, but the more I myself read, I'm not an expert on, on Rawls theory, but the more I read, the more uh, I realized, particularly with the concept of public space and public good, I think uh, the expectation is that his thinking is geared into European liberal tradition and the new arrivals like an Islamic moral tradition, it appears to me he's simply asking that tradition to simply convert itself to the categories of intelligibility of a secular liberal European tradition. And in other words, he really probably wants to be reducing Islam to a kind of level of Christianity, the way in which it dealt with secular liberal challenge. But Islam is altogether a different religion. It has a different sense of self-understanding. To my knowledge, this is where I'm a little bit disappointed. I, 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 don't, know, I don't claim expertise. But I think Rawls' moral theory, I think it is too much geared into European traditions. It doesn't really have patience with non-European moral traditions. And I, I would privilege Habermas really offered, or critical theory offers much more hope. Although even Habermas, sadly, with his demand for uh, make yourself intelligible, again, your language to that which that the liberal a secular democracy could understand, it could also be an implicit invitation to actually assimilation. But I do believe that Habermas's communicative action theory is much more actually open for uh, a reason, a reasoning, a rationality 
that is based on consensus building. I think that makes much more sense on, on Islamic tradition because in Islam, this is exactly how epistemology works. Islam actually works through consensus building. And, and I think Habermasian framework, I would say, progressive uh, framework, actually is much more promising than Rawls theory uh, or, 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 or take on how do we achieve social justice within a radical plural context. Thank you. Another question from Elif Medeni on teach training. In contrast to the UK, in Central Europe, for instance, Germany, Austria, Islamic religious education or Islamic teacher training programs and institutions are established parallel to Christian disciplines, tradition and logic. This has, of course, some advantages, such as being able to, divide, to dive into the current discourse of RE, but it also has some disadvantages in terms of how an independent own discourse can be established and def defined. For instance, defining core issues, what are reference theories, etc. So it's also, again, a question for Abdullah. All right, thank you, Elif. This is a really good question. I'm pleased that Elif is raising this because Elif is actually, she's our hope because she's the only Muslim educator who has the chance to run an Islamic teacher training agency or institution. So uh, <laughs> in fact, she is in a better position to answer this question than myself, but I would try my best. I think she is right that, um, you know, it's wonderful to have in Austrian context because of the legal recognition of Islam historically that Islam has sort of a balance really with the Catholic and Protestant churches to have an input into teacher, Muslim teacher training a process, which is brilliant. But again, because obviously we don't have enough theoretical practical models of Muslim teacher education, we fall back on to our wonderful colleagues from the Catholic and Protestant tradition. And this is wonderful stuff to draw on their experience and expertise. But clearly because Islamic education compared to Protestant education or Catholic education is really it is in infancy in Europe. We just don't have Islamically meaningful internal enough theories, perspectives. And, and that makes our job this difficult because, you know, how do you get really a, a teacher training that makes sense to Muslim parents and the community? And we also engage teachers with creativity of teaching and learning Islam. And whether these things all make sense on Islamic theological grounds. A big challenge. To, in my, no, I mean, to my knowledge, in, in, in England, of course, we don't have that denominational framework, which I would say it has a kind of a mixed sort of blessing, because I, I can work with normal teacher training agency, uh, our teacher training sort of specialist institution in, in, at Warwick, and where we can actually creatively collaborate with our mainstream RE teacher training so that if they are generic, they're not really specifically about Catholic or Protestant or religious, non-religious. These are you know, expertise on pedagogies where people have experimented how to research how best you can teach religious ideas. So I, I feel exposure to generic pedagogic specialism in a teacher training context could well be maybe uh, you know, positive. But nevertheless, I think this is another area of research because how in Europe we train Muslim educators. In fact, how do we train Muslim faith leaders? It is the biggest question. And, 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 and in Europe, sadly, we all fall back onto the existing uh, denominational framework. Maybe, you know, we need to really work out what would be an Islamically meaningful response to that process. And that requires, re requires research and, and really engaging with Islam theologically and, 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 and pedagogically. Uh, that is the hope, that is hope. So that isn't really an answer, sadly. <laughs> Maybe Austria is much more ahead of uh, all of us in Europe, but it is linked with faith leadership education as well. Yet again, we just don't have enough Islamic education expertise to be able to actually work out itself to guide us on this very important question. Thanks, Abdullah. Maybe a final question. Oh, there are other or almost final question. But first, um, again, a question from Patrick. Uh, this time for uh, Martin. 
uh, but maybe um, some of the other contributors can also uh, say something. Um, it's about um, whether there is no, really no empirical evidence about the results of several RE pedagogies in terms of tolerance and especially reflexivity and critical thinking in RE. So is there really no empirical evidence um, or is there, um, <laughs> Martin, maybe you know, or maybe um, your colleagues may know this. Perhaps Patrick uh, has a study, empirical study in his mind, but um, I just would like to make my point clear. Um, it's not about pedagogies, it's about different forms of RE in Europe. So this means uh, uh, empirical study where country, a country like Germany is a part of this denominational RE, but many others. Also perhaps more catechetical oriented, like um, let me say Poland, Hungary, uh, then England, it's different forms. And this question about empirical evidence, in my view, can't be answered by a qualitative study. It has to be representative to see really the effects of the respective form of RE. And I don't know a quantitative study that uh, deal with this uh, topic. But, but perhaps, Patrick, you do know more than I do. Okay, thanks. Um, two questions to, uh, to end. The first is um, for Abdullah and then to, to um, well, to end uh, in beauty. There is also a question for both of you. The first question uh, for Abdullah is from someone um, who's dealing with the Quran and Hadith from a pedagogical perspective. But there the uh, question is uh, what to do with uh, yeah, translations or, or interpretations of particular terms such as Ikra, uh, what is read, what does it mean in a controversial discussion or talum, uh, what does it mean? Uh, does it mean God teached Adam the names of the things or God teaches the Al Quran in the Sur Al Rahman? How do you interpret this and many other terms pedagogically? Right, this is from my esteemed colleague, Professor Yashar Sarikaya of Gizen University, I believe. Um, I've got his actually book just on this very question, but it said it's in German and I don't read German. Um, <laughs> uh, this is a really good question, but I think pedagogically engaging with this uh, uh, educational vocabulary of the Quran that he mentions, uh, well, we have to obviously contextualize the Quran itself. You know, clearly we can't simply take out the word Iqra and then say, oh, it means read, therefore we simply have to read in a very simplistic, instrumentalist way. When you unpack this concept and the kind of the metaphor that is depicted in the Quran, God as an educator teaching humanity, uh, clearly in, in order to benefit with this rich pedagogic vocabulary of the Quran, you have to really contextualize the Quran itself in its language. Uh, we know that that teaching was not really meant to be simply instru instruction once for all, because the Quran was revealed 23 years. So clearly God was teaching Muhammad and the early Muslim community in a very developmental fashion. It couldn't have been simply one instruction and that's it. Um, and also the word Iqra, isn't it? Uh, as you know, it goes back to Syriac origin. It doesn't really mean always literacy in the in the way that we understand today because Quran was revealed in an oral culture. Really here, it's kind of not simplistically to, 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 to kind of read, but also to cry out loud praise of God, to express God's praise. But also it means to simply be able to connect because qara means to connect things. So in other words, we need to, the first thing would be <clears throat> to contextualize the Quranic pedagogic vocabulary itself so that we can discern some pedagogic uh, principles and values out of it. Otherwise, it will be rather uh, very lit literalist and simplistic. And if you look at the long run, you can see that the Quran actually has a developmental approach to learning and teaching, where act of reading, reflecting, and, and critical thinking, in fact, tadabbur, tafakkur, are all accompanying that language. So the Quran is actually quite rich. In fact, to reach that one of the modern 
living expert on the Quran, the German uh, famous scholar of the Quran, uh, uh, Angelika Nurwit, for example, she believes that the Quran has such an uh, interesting pedagogic vocabulary, it has created an epistemic space in the seventh century antique world, but actually it has transformed this whole notion of learning and teaching, in fact, knowledge itself. So, you know, it is fascinating. I can lecture on this <laughs> endlessly, Yashar. But I would say the first thing would be not to start with the literal meaning of these words as in translation. They are really rich and they all end up actually developing a perspective that takes the learner, privilege of the learner, rather than simply a top to bottom instruction. It's now for Okay, thanks. Now the final question for both of you from my, Nigel Van Kook from uh, Oxford. To what extent is recognizing the different heritages of Muslim populations across Europe a challenge in framing Islam at European level? He refers to the Turkish community in Germany, Algerian community in France, Pakistani in UK, etc. I think both of you can say some interesting things about that. Martin? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I will try. <laughs> um, um, Nigel, I do think that the most important uh, aspect or the most important part of religious education are the pupils. So it's the starting point and the center of uh, and the goal of religious education. We do it for the pupils. So for sure, we have to look at the respective uh, influences they do have in the, in the classroom. But also Sahin said, we have to be contextual. So um, it, it wouldn't make no sense uh, to talk in, 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 in Germany primarily about an Islam who is imprinted, imprinted of Algeria. But we have to look at our specific class. Yeah, how um, the, the, uh, how the pupils and the, the, especially the Muslim uh, pupils are imprinted. This is a decisive point, I would say. Abdullah, do you want to add something? Yeah, I'll just add, you know, we have to acknowledge the diversity of Islam and, and you know, Muslim communities. Uh, I think, again, to me, really, the heritage is very crucial, but as we've just you know, heard, what is more crucial is whether Islam could be rearticulated within European context with all its sub traditions. And that is the task, of, task for young Muslims, European Muslims. Uh, because if you don't resource them enough, they will not be able to actually articulate an Islam that will make sense in European context. I am not much bothered whether Islam comes from India or Pakistan or Turkey or Saudi Arabia. What I am more concerned whether this package, this these identity narratives are unchanged across generation. If, if we make the teaching and learning of Islam simply keeping this essentialized so-called packaged Islam, this is no good. The point is, can we have an, an RE system where we really build confidence and, and knowledge and resources for young European Muslims who really care about their Islam and care about the fact that they are part of Europe? The challenge is, can we get can we help them to next next level of being able to now be agents, active agents of, be able to articulate uh, an Islam with all its complexity within the European context? And I think this is where uh, I would say that we have a lot really to achieve. That doesn't mean, you know, we don't have to give up on the generic RE system, where we facilitate learning about Islam. We facilitate public knowledge about Islam that is also crucial for non-Muslims. But I think we have to realize that this learning and teaching of Islam is really a complex task. Public uh, space is only one aspect of this. It's crucial, but only one aspect. To me, all of these settings, educational settings are wonderful opportunities to be able to bring about a much more reflective, responsible, contextual sense of being Muslim. And for this, we don't have to help people to be self-censored. All traditions are welcome, but we cannot allow these package narratives to be reenacted forcefully in the life of young European Muslims. I want an Islamic education or an Islamic religious education to actually uh, facilitate that process for 
the diverse learners. And that requires building resources, pedagogic creativity, uh, curriculum creativity, all kinds of things, teacher, teacher education. And that is really what ultimately, you know, I think is crucial because that will enhance a kind of a mature or mature expressions of Islam across Europe. If you don't have that resource, the chances are an instruction uh, model of learning and teaching Islam will try to reproduce the same. And therefore it will reproduce the prejudices and the simplicities in the life of young people. I, I would say Islam as it is lived out, it's, its complex heritage is all welcome. What we need is to help young people to contextualize this information knowledge and be inspired that they could actually now much more maturely express this uh, knowledge of Islam. That is a more exciting and interesting challenge, I would say. Okay, thanks. Let's, um, well, stop with this exciting and interesting challenge. I think um, there can be much more questions uh, asked here, but um, maybe some of you are hungry or are just uh, screen tired or whatever. Um, so I think um, if you want to, to know more, there's the book you can, of course, read. There is the conference that will be held in March in uh, Antwerp. And um, I would like to thank you all, um, UCI, of course, for organizing this um, webinar, for co-organizing it. And um, again, all of you who participated in this um, webinar. So I hope to see you later in real life. Thank you very much. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for hosting me. Thank <laughs> you.